you can, I think you can exit full screen if you don't if you want to be able to move around. Yeah, I am. Um, we okay. use Zoom at the, at the university that I do instructional design at, and then we used it in my master's of ed tech program. So I love Zoom. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So you can teach me a few things. So Valerie, tell me where, as we wait for people to drop in here, um, where are, do you teach for Rio or are you part of their programs? How, how do you fit in? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I am in the process of obtaining an adjunct position to teach introductory business. I have an MBA um, and I am a new K through like workshop teachings um, into, and now I'm moving into the K through 12 space. So it's really exciting. I'm, I'm excited to be able to do both. Oh, that's great. So where, what's, what school district are you in? Are you in Arizona? Yeah, um, yes, I live in Arizona. Um, and then um, ASU Prep is the um, institution that has offered me the position. Oh, I think I know somebody who might work there. But I could oh, be, cool. he might work for the he might work for the College of Education at ASC. His name is Barnaby. Um, his last name starts with a W. He's a great guy, Wasson. Oh, okay. So I think he's at the. I think he might be at the graduate school. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know very many people. And I caught the last part. I don't think I re I remember to to record at the beginning of the last webinar. So I don't have the whole thing, but I got the last part when I came back in because um, the way we have Zoom set up, it starts recording when I come into the room, um, unless I stop it. And I didn't stop at that time. So I got the last part of it and I looked at the clip and I immediately texted Kim Toby, who's in charge of this. And, and you know, they've followed up with me about who, who we might think it was or whatever. Um, and I looked at the video later and it looked like it was a video clip. It wasn't a live webcam. So I think it was somebody coming in showing if anything happens, I can not panic and deal with it appropriately. This has never happened to me before. Wow. So yeah, it was a little alarming. Um, anyway, um, Pete, hi. So my husband's in, uh, rustling around his desk right now uh, trying to get something so anyway let's go ahead and get started with this and um, if, if there are anything I can see the chat and everything so if there are any problems or if you have any questions please type in there or or unmute your, yourself and ask a question feel free to interrupt me oh, so last week was stressful and this week won't go better I'm sure um, so if you're not familiar with our Tech Talk series, I will go section number nine. I think I misnumbered it. But um, today we're talking about flipped learning, which is an instructional strategy that I think you will find beneficial whether you are a kindergarten teacher or a college teacher. And um, this is a topic that I, I, well, first of all, we want to thank Rio for putting on this series. And we really appreciate the Educators Rising program. And we hope that people will take advantage of these recordings post uh, record, post uh, live webinar. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I am a, a former classroom teacher, technology coach, and turned consultant. I do some adjunct work for National Lewis University in Chicago, where I am based. And I think of me as your personal tech coach um, between now and the end of August. Because and uh, you'll see the list of topics that we've covered so far. And they're, um, they're designed to kind of lead you from the basics to the more sophisticated things. And upon um, I'm going to mute whoever just came in just to make sure that we um, we don't have. Uh, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so, so we are. Um, so this series was is designed to go from kind of basic stuff to more sophisticated stuff. And if I were doing this all over again, tonight's topic, flipped learning, I might have put towards the end because it's a little overwhelming, I think, to people who might be new to using technology. But my general impression has been. Um, my cat is now um, playing with a ball right near my feet. So if you hear a little bell, that's my cat who's decided to play right now. Uh, anyway, I would have, um, most of the people that have come to these webinars are fairly conversant with technology. So maybe this won't be overwhelming to you. But this is a really broad topic. And tonight I kind of want to gauge your experience, um, try to answer some of your questions and, and point you to some really good resources so that you have an idea about flipped learning and, and what it looks like and how you might use it in a variety of settings. So that's our goal tonight. All of our resources are in Google Classroom. We, um, you need to use your own, for the people who are new, you need to use a personal Gmail address because if you try to use a Gmail address from your school or institutions, uh, Google's G Suite setup, it, you may not be allowed to work in other, um, 
other domains with that Gmail address. So make sure that you can, um, you have your own Gmail address and that you can get in here. And the way that you go into it is you go to classroom.google.com, which is listed here on the right, and you're going to log in with your personal Gmail address. And then there's a plus sign in the upper right hand corner. And you're going to click on that and you'll see a word that says join. It says join and you'll put in a code, which is on this page, but I'm also going to show you um, here. This is the code. So you may want to take a picture of this or quickly jot this down so that you can get into our Google Classroom. And I've put together a slew of resources for you, which we will go through in a little bit. So just to review, you go to classroom.google.com, log in with your personal Gmail address, go to the upper right-hand corner, and you should see a plus sign. It's pretty small, so you may have to look for it. Uh, select teachers, we're probably going to be going into schools with Google setups. You could do something similar to what we're doing with these resources in other platforms, Schoology, Edmodo. I'm sure um, Microsoft has a similar kind of product. The Google Classroom really is a platform for organizing your materials, setting due dates, assigning thing, work to your, your students, and um, able, you're able to collect student work as well in it. And the way I've set it up is, maybe I should just um, click out of here for a second and show you what it looks like. So this is Google Classroom. And I belong to several of them. And as I've mentioned before, um, I took a class from a guy named Tony Vincent called Classy Graphics. And what he did was he charged people for the class and then he gave us a code to join it. And it had all of his video tutorials on how to make graphics and weekly assignments for about six weeks um, last fall. It was really, and that's where I kind of got the idea for this, was that it's not just for students, it, we can also use it for, 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 for professional development. Uh, and Valerie has a really good question. Do you feel Edmodo is as good as a tool as Google Classroom or Schoology? They all seem to have some limitations. Um, excellent question. I, in all transparency, I do social media work for Edmodo as, my, as a consultant, and I like it. Um, because I like it for its simplicity, and I think for students, it's pretty easy to use. This is also simple. Um, what you're getting with Edmodo is more of a, a wraparound service. You're getting, you're getting a network of people that you can collaborate with in different topics and different groups there that are public. Um, they also have a blog um, that it has materials, and they also have something called Edmodo Spotlight, which contains uh, curricular materials that you can take and put into your Edmodo groups. So it really depends. Um, I think some people may think that Edmodo used to be very innovative when it first came out. It was, it was one of the initial platforms for doing this sort of thing. Um, yes, Edmodo does great. Because, you know, now that they've been acquired by a big company like that, there might be more development coming that may be useful. So they typically roll out things over the summer in the back to school season. So stay tuned and see what comes out. So play around with them. I mean, I think that the big lesson here is you want to try different things and see what works best for you. What might work well, well for me may not be your cup of tea. And so I really encourage teachers to try things out. And if you don't like it, you can always move on to something else. So that's kind of my, my take on it. So this is the stream that you're seeing right now of posts, um, very similar to Facebook. You know, you have this kind of middle area where you see the questions that we've had, and I've labeled them by letter because what I realized tonight when I got to number 10, it put it at the top. It didn't go in order. <laughs> and, um, and you can't drag and drop these topics in order. So I labeled them by letters so that they would be in some sort of semblance of an order. Um, and so when you click on one of these, um, so you'll see the teacher's lounge is supposed to be an area where we can share ideas and ask questions and things like that anytime. Um, and then you'll see, yeah, go ahead. Did some, hi, Kim. Or did somebody say something? Uh, hello. Sorry. Hi. Hi, Ruby. It's my friend Ruby. Ruby, have you recovered from last week? Yes. I'm sorry to be late today. It's okay. Don't worry. It's no big deal. We talked about the incident earlier. Uh, and I, I mentioned, Ruby, that I think that, you know, I made the link public on, on Twitter and Facebook, and some, I think some goof came in that way. So that will never happen again. And I hope you weren't too traumatized. But uh, I'm prepared. I'm prepared to deal with it today. And I was so freaked out last time that I, I kind of panicked. So we're moving on. Um, anyway, so here's the classroom. Um, and you can see each topic. The slides are in here. And there's an evaluation if people want to fill it out. And then there's usually some resources. 
on that particular topic. Of course, I don't think that you're going to go look at all these resources. This is like a standing, you know, right away. This is like a standing thing for you to go back and review and play and practice with it after you've had this webinar. So tonight, this is, um, these are our resources for tonight. Here's the link to the room. Here's uh, the slides. So you can get into the slides that I'm showing. Um, they should be publicly available to you. And then I have tons of resources because A, I'm not a flipped learning expert by any means. I'm doing a very cursory overview of it tonight. Um, and there's a lot to kind of dig into. So if you are really intrigued by this model, um, you know, look through some of these resources that I put in here. And FYI, in Google Classroom, you can only put 20 resources in a post. So that's why there are two posts. Um, but typically, this is kind of the pattern I follow with every webinar. I give you the link to the webinar. I give, and I will also post the recording here, and um, the slides will are here, plus additional resources for future um, perusing. So that's kind of how um, I I organize this. Now let me get back to my slides. Now that I've gone over that, because I, I think it's really important for you guys to access all this stuff. Uh, I want to make sure I'm clear on it. Um, tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, last week's uh, webinar and what, how that relates tonight. Uh, talk about the ISTE standards, and if you're not familiar with those, I'll, I'll explain those. Give you an overlo uh, overview of flipped learning, and then I'd like to talk about this a little bit with you and see if you're using this approach already, um, if you have any burning questions, that sort of thing, and we can kind of dig through some of the resources that I've uh, provided for you. So ISTE is the International Society for Technology and Education, and it is the big ed tech organization for the world. Uh, it's a little US centric, but it's really theoretically an international organization. And they deal with K-12 educators as well as teacher educators. Um, and they have a big conference that's taking place in my hometown starting Sunday. So I'm excited because 18,000 people are descending upon uh, a convention center in downtown Chicago uh, to talk about all this geeky stuff, and, and that's my thing. That's my favorite thing to do. So there are standards for students, for administrators, for educators, for computer science teachers, for all different kinds of populations within the ed tech world. And you should, you know, if you're going into a classroom, you should probably familiarize with these two. So the links are in the slides. Um, and tonight we're looking at um, these are the these are the four standards that we're we're looking at um, in particular. Yeah, I feel like this, this webinar is addressing. So improving your practice, um, you're collaborating with people here in the webinar and in our Google Classroom, um, you're learning how to design authentic learner-driven learner activities and environments, and you're facilitating learning with technology to support student achievement. That's really all addressed here by the flipped learning topic. Um, so without further ado, I kind of want to go into this um, and tell you a little bit about my experiences with flipped learning. So the two gurus behind flipped learning are uh, two educators who I think worked together in Colorado at some point. And uh, John Bergman, who now lives here in Chicago, and Aaron Sams, who lives in Pittsburgh. And they use this in their high school teaching. I want to say John was a tech coordinator in a district where um, Aaron was a teacher, and Aaron might be a chemistry teacher. And they basically came up with this model where you provide content to your students for homework that they, 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 they view or they, they take in somehow. And then you, you devote your class time to more hands-on activities, more coaching kinds of activities, ones that really, uh, activities that really uh, focus on the teacher uh, being a guide. And it's, it's meant to be to get away from the traditional model of teacher being the sage on the stage. Skeptical of this at first because I thought showing a video was not necessarily anything new. Um, I was in Singapore, I don't know if it was, I went to Singapore twice, 2008 or 2012, and I, I think it was 2012, I was explaining this to some Singaporean teachers, and their education system is very good, um, and the teachers are very familiar with different pedagogical concepts. And when I mentioned this to them, they go, oh, that's blah, 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 blah. And I, I think they said reciprocal teaching, um, but I could be wrong. And it wasn't necessarily new to them, but I think that this has, may have you know, originally been something like reciprocal teaching, but it's really evolved into a whole global community of people who are really dedicated to And I want to show you a video. And um, let me know, if I take my earphones out, you should be able to hear it, I think. So let me make sure um, that you can. 
So I want to make sure the audio is always a little dicey here. Um, and I'm doing this from multiple computers, so let's see if it will work. Okay, let me try it here. So this uh, video is done, um, I think this is a network of videos that you can purchase. And there's a certain style here called, um, that this Common Craft company has perfected. And I don't know exactly what the story is. You can watch the video here, but I couldn't embed it because you had to be part of the network for it. But you can watch the video and they'll give you a sense of what, what it's about. There's, a, there's a, a watermark on it that's a little annoying, but you'll get the drift. So let me know in the chat if you can hear it once it starts. I don't hear anything yet myself. Come on, video. Oh, it's going, but I don't hear anything. Maybe because I don't have the sound up on my phone. See, and it's going to echo because it's on my other computer. I really want to start it from here. Let me stop something here. I'm going to stop. Hang on. I got this. I'm going to share it from my other computer, and then you'll be able to hear the audio. OK. Okay. This is better. Most students know the difference between learning and practicing. Learning might mean listening to a lecture, while practicing is solving problems based on that lesson. Traditionally, class time is used to learn the materials and how to solve problems. Then, for homework, the students focus on practicing and turn in homework the next day. Today, a concept called the flipped classroom is changing this by flipping the traditional approach. Here, students learn the material at home and then use classroom time to work through the problems. This way, when a student needs more guidance, the teacher is available to help. Consider how it worked for Juanita. Her 12th grade math class was starting to learn calculus in the traditional way. She spent most of each class lecturing and teaching her students the basic theories of calculus. Then they completed practice problems as homework. This approach had obvious problems. The students would become bored in class lectures and tune out. Then at home, they would get stuck and become frustrated, resulting in incomplete homework. Recently, Juanita tried a flipped classroom instead. Here, she assigns students a different kind of homework, not problems to solve, but concepts and ideas to understand. This way, her students were in control of their learning. They could read materials, watch videos, and participate in online discussions on their own time and choice of devices. To help, Juanita learned how to record videos and lectures that students could watch at home. Then, the next day in the classroom, Time was used for solving real problems. Juanita could be there when the students needed her help. They could apply what they learned at home to problems and group activities in the classroom. Using the flipped classroom, Juanita's students were more engaged in class and less frustrated because she was there to be a guide. She knows the flipped classroom is not perfect. Not every student has devices and connections they need for learning at home. For others, distractions at home may make self-directed learning difficult. But overall, Juanita's experience has been like many other teachers. The flipped classroom can offer a different approach that serves to optimize the time she has with students. Okay, so I'm gonna put my earphones back in and then I can hear, I can hear you better. Okay, there we go. 
So, um, so Flip Classroom is, I love these videos from Khan Craft because they're very simple um, and they're visual and they get their point across. And I thought that video, that video could explain it a little bit more than I, better than I could in, in simplified terms. Um, this is one approach that may be referred to as blended learning. You may have heard that term. And blended learning is really a vague term that people <clears throat> kind of argue about in the ed tech world. But essentially there's a book out there called Blended uh, by, by Michael Horn and Heather somebody whose name I'm forgetting. And it talks about different kinds of strategies for using technology to teach kids uh, and adults. And uh, one model is a station rotation model. The flipped classroom is another model. Uh, but it's really technology-driven instruction. And I think some people feel it is uh, a little too much on the tech and not enough on the teacher. And so our challenge is to think about how we can use our talents, our human talents, in combination with the technology to create powerful experiences for students. Um, Christina, or Valerie asked me, earlier too, this is a, a good time to address this. What's the relationship between ISTE and INACOL for virtual learning? So ISTE is, the, is, is kind of the grand and daddy of them all in terms of ed tech conferences. INACOL is all about online learning. And I've heard their conference is really good. I've not been to it. I don't think it's nearly the same size as ISTE. At the ISTE conference, there's probably 18,000 people there at least. Um, INACOL, I'm not so sure about. INACOL tends to also seem to draw the charter school and blended learning crowd more than ISTE, and I could be wrong on that, but that's kind of my general impression. Uh, the woman that heads INACOL, her name is Susan Patrick, and people think very highly of her. She was the head of the Office of Ed Tech for the Department of Education under uh, George W. Bush, I believe. So, um, so that's the, that's the that's kind of it in a nutshell. Now, um, Christina's pointing out that or asking about, um, you know, uh, about problems with students not completing homework when they arrived unprepared for discussion the next day. And I saw something today that said you don't enable kids to, you don't you don't reteach because your kids haven't missed the content if they haven't come prepared. They need to experience the uncomfortableness of, of not being prepared and doing activities that you've done. Now, if you have a lot of kids who are not prepared, then my, you know, I think the general advice would be to scout, you're not somehow the, the how you learn at home and how you, in, how you take in the content, whether it's videos or some other kind of content at home, you need to kind of model the procedures you want kids to be able to do. So you might, sh you might do it in class first and then and, and have some sort of structure and, and ask kids to refer to that um, when they're working at home as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, our kids don't, with special needs don't need to experience any discomfort with not participating. That's a really good, qu that's a really good point. Have you, um, so Ruby, you could do it with younger kids. There was an example that I looked at that was first graders, but they didn't flip the whole classroom and all of their curriculum and everything at once. They just did a lesson. And I think the advice from a lot of these people is going, uh, who are experts in this are gonna, they're gonna say start small. I think it's a really, really laborious, time consuming process to do this and you have to be thoughtful with it. The other problem that I've seen noted is that many teachers, and I think this goes to an American problem in general. Like I was, I was talking about Singapore earlier. Singaporean teachers know different pedagogical um, choices. They know the different strategies to use in the classroom really well and really deeply. I'm not so sure here in the US that we've done a great job of, of teaching inquiry and other approaches to um, teachers that invite deep learning. And so, yeah, and so, um, and it, it's a journey. It's a journey as a teacher to figure out how you can deepen the learning, I think. And I think we all struggle with it. I struggle with it with, with, with students who are adults, right? 
So, um, so I think that's part of the problem. So what people have noted is that it's easy to send a kid home with a video, right? Or, or some other thing to learn at home, but then knowing how to use that time effectively when they come back to the classroom in engaging ways, that's where a lot of people have problems. And I also think that would also applies to schools where they've moved to block scheduling. In my son's high school, they have, I don't know how long, the 70 minute blocks? It's gotta be longer than that. Maybe it's 120 minute blocks now. And that's a lot of time to be with kids and to keep them occupied and to keep them engaged. And so if, um, if you don't plan well and intentionally, you're going to have issues. Um, and I think that's true regardless of whatever classroom setup. But I think particularly with this model and with a blocked schedule, you're going to run into that. So have you guys had any experience with flipped? What do you know about it so far or anything? Kim, have you taught with 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 uh, flipped at all, or do you have teachers that have used this? Um, yes, and I would say that we we still struggle because the concept is similar in that you used to give students reading from a textbook um, and ask them to come prepared to engage in the conversation. Now, the difference I believe with flipped classrooms is that, that we're intentionally allowing them to know what we're going to be talking about within the classroom, but you still deal with the same issues that if there's not necessarily the support um, or, or a level of, I don't even know if it's engagement that we struggle with, but it's still the concept that you have to, the students have to take it seriously. Yeah in terms of desiring to plan ahead so that they can come in and have an informed conversation. They have to be relatively motivated, it seems. Correct, like. correct. And, um, I had a friend who was a principal of a school in Philadelphia. He and I went to a workshop on this at ISTE a number of years ago with John Bergman. And he, then my friend turned to me and said, what's the difference between this and asking students to read a, a novel before they come to class for English or something? And that's a really good question. And I, I, my impression is that this has evolved in ways um, since then. This, this is probably about, you know, this workshop that I attended was probably around its infancy or, of this particular movement. Um, and I think that's, I think that, I, we'll explore some of these resources and see where it leads us, but I think that it's the intentionality and planning piece is really, really important in how you're engaging your students and, 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 the, and teaching the kids how to learn. And often, and I uh, do think, sorry, Lucy, I do think that's the biggest difference is generally with a flipped classroom, what you're going to try and do is not only give the reading, but you're really gonna start to direct them to know what the questions are and what the conversation is gonna lead to, so that hopefully they come in, it's not like they have to read a book and try and figure out exactly what they're supposed to find important as much as we give them the reading and then say, okay, come prepared to at least respond to these prompts. Instead, you're setting a purpose for the reading, which is good reading practices anyway, right? So Valerie, uh, so uh, Christina's saying, I've heard that it, you've heard about it and you used it with a PBL class. You did research before they claim, came to class to apply skills. Okay. And how did it work, Christina? Did it work well for you? Hi there. Yeah, for the most part it did. We, I had, you know, higher functioning kids, you know, it was a special education school. So higher functioning kids, mostly grade level, close to grade level. So that, that type of profile student was motivated by coming prepared and, and participating and, and that type of thing. Though there was, were some who weren't and they just wanted to escape the, the tasks. Did you, give them, did you give them an assignment or research questions or anything like that mm -hmm. to guide? Oh yeah, 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 very guided. Yeah, I think, I, see, I think kids do well when they have some sort of checklist or, you know, something to go with it, right? Yeah, and, you start with the brick. yeah, yeah, I think they, if you set the expectations for them and you guide them through it, I think it just eliminates the chances of being, of, 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 of it not working well. Now with older kids, with college age students, I'm not so sure what the story is. The students I've worked with in general um, have been pretty motivated and excited about things. And I think online teaching really essentially is flipped teaching in a lot of ways already. Um, but I guess it's finding a, finding, 
I would say A, finding good content is important. B, structuring the, the assignment or project or whatever you're doing in, in interesting and meaningful ways. Teaching your kids how to, to, to use this model and, and setting the expectations for them. And then also, I would say, is what your engagement is in the classroom itself with the kids and the relationship that you have with your students, I think is going to be the, you know, another component to make you know, successful. If you're just going to have your kids, if you're a science teacher and you ask your kids to come in, like they do the, the reading first and then they come in, they do a lab for the, for the experiential piece, um, that's all well and good, but like what, where, where are you involved with it? You know, are you coming around and helping it? You know, are you doing it with them? Um, I think that's, that's the question here. Um, Valerie says, uh, did you say that a flipped classroom is difficult with black classes? I actually think it would work well with black classes the problem is, Valerie, is that people are not, uh, some teachers may not be adept at using all that time effectively and creatively. That's my concern is that, that they're, uh, they don't know what to do with the, the time that they're face-to-face. -face. I, I think teaching in a traditional way is kind of a crutch when you're using a textbook and you're lecturing the kids. That's pretty easy. What's the hardest part of teaching is how you're authentically engaging kids and doing hands-on experiential stuff. And that's, you know, when you have a big block of time, it's going to make it harder. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's, you can either look at it as like, oh my gosh, that's really scary to have all that time with these kids. Or you can look at it as like, this is a really fun opportunity to kick things up a notch with my kids. I think that's how I would look like it. Um, and yes, I do think it would look with, work well with inquiry based and with social collaboration. And absolutely. Um, Ruby, I don't think you, you could pretest. And, and do a post test. I mean, I think most high school teachers probably have to do that for sure anyway. Um, and I think that will kind of give you an idea of whether the kids are learning. This is not exactly an example of, of um, flipped. I think I mentioned this when we talked about spreadsheets, but I had a colleague who taught fourth grade math. And, and she would, she had them in different groups. She differentiated and um, they would, as an exit ticket, they would use their iPads to and an app called EduCreations, which is a screencasting app, to uh, answer a problem and show their work. And then they would post the video somewhere and get the link to the video. And they would fill out a form and put the link into the form and their answer. It was only like two or three fields, like their name, the link, and then the answer. And in the Google form, it, it puts all the data into a spreadsheet, into a Google spreadsheet. And she had conditional formatting on the spreadsheet. So if the answer was right, the cell turned red or green. And if it, um, oops, there goes my ear. Um, if the um, answer was right, it would turn, the cell turned green. And so um, she was able to look at the spreadsheet and automatically see who got it right, who didn't get it right. And she would go and look at the videos of the kids who did the math problem uh, and got the wrong answer because she wanted to see where they went wrong in their math thinking. And then she would, next day, she would rearrange her math groups and she'd reteach the concept to the kids who didn't get it. So it didn't leave a lot of room for kids to fall through the cracks when she did that on a repeated basis. Uh, it's, that's not quite a flip learning experience, but it's using video in a pretty creative way. Um, would it work better for some subjects or science like social studies? I think, yeah, I, Christina is right. I think it would be all, all subject areas. Is there a trick to keeping students on track with learning if they have independent time in class or activities or peer groups? That's a really good question. Again, I think like checklists and that sort of thing work really well, Valerie. And, um, when I was in school, when I was in fourth grade, one of my most meaningful experiences was that I had a teacher who had a contract with us every single week. And there were certain basic things we had to do every week and check them off. And then there were things for when we wanted to go above and beyond the call of duty, and we got stars for these. And I've never remember, I remember being so motivated <laughs> by this. Um, and I think adapting that in some way for kids, you know, spelling out what is to be expected and what you, when you need it by, and, you know, any kinds of, of, of scaffolding that you can provide just will really, really help, even if they're young kids. So we could kind of, yeah, it's kind of a glorified rubric. It wasn't about, like, 
the quality of stuff necessarily. It was about certain tasks. Um, and, and then, you know, we still met with her and, and had, um, you know, small groups and that sort of thing, but it was really a way to see what we were doing. And we got these stars and she kept track of them on a chart, which I don't know if it's good practice nowadays because it kind of puts kids on the spot. I'm not a good, I'm not a fan of publicly doing things like that with kids. Uh, but man, I was motivated in fourth grade. So, um, Think about experimenting with this, and, and let's get into a little bit more of, um, of I, I want to show you how to get connected and learn more about this, and then I want to go through some of the resources and some of the things I found that you might have more questions about as we go along. So John Bergman and Aaron, um, and a bunch of other people who are involved with this, who've really taken to it, started a network called the Flip Learning Network, and it's a free social network around people who are using um, using this model. So my, I would, I think you need to get connected to learn from others. I think that's where you're going to pick up speed with this. So one way to get uh, involved is to join this. They do, it looks like they have a podcast. They probably do webinars. I found John in a lot of webinars that are, are listed in our resources. And they also have a conference and the conference is going on next week, but I'm not sure where they typically host it in a high school somewhere. Um, so this is really, it's just amazing to me um, how many people have, have gotten involved with this and have, have picked up on this. So that's the first place that I would go if I were you wanting to learn more. The other piece um, is, I didn't, I, I didn't mean to make that flip, but I guess I, I'm glad I did now. Um, there is, uh, on Twitter, I'm a big fan of Twitter, and there are a lot of teachers who are connecting on Twitter using hashtags, and these are some of the ones that they're using. So for instance, if you um, uh, go to, let's see. And you don't even have to post to Twitter yourself. You, you just have to search with this hashtag. So if you type in, you know, flipped learning or flipped classroom, you can see how other teachers are using um, this. And the, the video is not gonna show up because I have, I think, uh, there's a video here, here it is. Um, so there's videos that people post um, and they're sharing their tips and tricks and things like that. Um, here's somebody who's, who's blogging about her experiences. So this, this is her seven easy steps. Mind map a single lesson or unit that you want to flip. Not all lessons are flippable. Develop the flipped homework assignment. Um, what will you ask them to view at home? What will you ask them to do at home? Maybe you do something, it's not just viewing at home. You don't want to make it too passive. And then develop a follow-up activity for class. How will you assess the completion of homework? What will you be doing with them in class to follow up or reinforce or extend the material? And then prep students and do assignment. Uh, areas of success and improvement, begin developing your own online materials, create a platform for students that is consistent portal to lessons. So this sounds like it's, it, the stuff at the end sounds like once you've kind of mastered this roadmap, then, you know, you probably want to start thinking about how do you develop your own materials instead of using other people's and what platform are you going to use for this as you develop your materials. That's what my interpretation of this is. But anyway, you might, you never know what you're going to find here. Um, this woman is uh, talking about Edpuzzle. And we should talk about Edpuzzle really quickly because I think this is important. So a lot of people are using this tool and there are a couple other ones that are out there. Um, it's free for a certain amount of videos that you produce. And you can log in with your Google account, which is awesome. And it always makes things easy. And I, I may have talked about this before with, when we talked about YouTube. And the reason I did YouTube before this session was that I wanted to make sure that you had some experience with it. I definitely used this when I, I did a conference at Rio last year. So um, what this does is you can put a video in um, here from YouTube or whatever, and you can assign it to students, but you can also annotate the video. And I haven't done this in a while, so 
um, here, I'm gonna have to think about here. So here's, let's say here's a, a video. I can assign it to students, but there's a way to annotate it. So I can, I can assign it to my different classes I have here. But that's not what I wanna do. I want to, um, there are my classes, here's my content. I want to edit. It. Oh, I want to edit it. That's what it is. Okay, so here's a video, right? I can um, at the top of it. I there's I can add an audio track to it. So audio annotations. I can um, and audio notes um, that they go up here. But I can also input a, a quiz in here, and I can also trim the video a little bit. So you don't have to have students watching a 45 minute video. Sometimes maybe you just want them to watch a portion of it. And so you can crop a video here, add some, you know, whatever you want to in terms of audio, and then put some quiz questions in here to test their knowledge as they go. When you're done with this, um, you sign it to a class and you have your in, in there, and there's a code, just like our Google Classroom code, there's a code that you give students to join your class and access the assignments. And they'll take a quiz and then you'll have access to the results of that quiz that you've embedded in that video. So people are using Edpuzzle. There are lots and lots of different tools you can use, but this one um, is great. So Valerie uses, okay, you use, so Valerie used that in Nearpod. I love Nearpod. So you guys have a lot of good feedback here. Um, so Kim is saying, what, what we've seen is that we use the flipped classroom regularly, not meaning every day, but at least regularly, the students begin to respond because they recognize that they will have more opportunities for participation in deeper connections activities. I think that's smart too, Kim, to use it strategically and not all the time. I've seen some people who flip their entire curriculum, and that seems really boring to me and kind of cookie cutter. So I think that's smart. And then Valerie, you're talking about Nearpod. I love Nearpod. Nearpod is, is somewhat similar. Um, and I don't know Video Ant. Video Ant's a new one to me. I'll have to check that out. So this is one of many tools, and we'll get into the tools a little bit more, but I wanted to make sure that you guys, I want to see that you guys get connected to other teachers. And even if you lurk and you don't re respond to people or whatever, um, you know, this is, this is one of the benefits of, of Twitter. You can also, in Twitter, um, look at this guy. He says, PLN, any recommendations for a flipped classroom um, teacher videos for year nine geography? My nephew thanks you in advance. Um, so this is guys, he's from Australia probably because he's using the hashtag AussieEd. And PLN stands for your professional learning network. So when you join Twitter um, you, and start following other teachers, you're developing your professional learning network. And this will be really valuable for just in time and help from other people. I really want teachers to become more self-reliant or reliant on their PLNs for advice and encouragement and resources. And that's what this guy is doing. He's like, hey, I need this video. And you can see that five people responded to him, it looks like, if I can figure out how to see those comments. I don't know why I'm not being able to do it, but I, theoretically you should be able to see the comments when you click on that bubble. Anyway, um, so Twitter is one way to do it and is, is to start building your, your professional learning network. And these are some of the hashtags that I've noticed have content that might be relevant to you. And again, these slides are, are available, so don't feel like you have to write all of this down. There are also people um, on Twitter and that you might want to follow, specifically the Flip Learning Network, Aaron Sam. Um, and John Bergman, I, if I think of other people, I'll add them to this. Kate Baker is an Edmodo ambassador that I know who is an eighth grade uh, English language arts teacher, and she does a lot of flipped learning, and there's an article in my resources, I think, that she's written. So those are just a few people that you might want to connect to on Twitter. Um, in terms of finding resources, last week we talked about YouTube, and I want to come back to this again especially for the people who weren't able to be with us, and that's not the right link. Um, let me pull it up for you, and I'll, I'll fix it in the slides afterwards. So I use a tool called Digo for bookmarking things. And I have a whole list of educational YouTube channels that um, is in the YouTube section of our resources, but I will also put it in um, our Flip Classroom one. So if you're wondering, where do I find a video or a particular subject, 
Um, so these are some suggestions of, of high quality channels for teachers and for students. So one of the ones that's listed here that's taking a minute to come up is Crash Course. If you haven't seen this, I love Crash Course. Let's see if it'll come up. Here we go. Crash Course is um, done by Hank Green, who wrote a uh, number on our star, or not number of our stars, um, Fault in Our Stars, and his brother um, produces a lot of videos too. They do, uh, Hank Green does SciShow, they do Crash Course together, they do Vlog Brothers together, where they, 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 they produce videos back and forth in conversation with each other. And this one, a Crash Course is just awesome. And there's, there's curricular materials that go with a lot of these units as well. Particularly if you're a middle school or high school teacher, this is going to be um, really, really useful to you. There's tons and tons and tons of stuff here. So you could take a video. Um, we're going to have to listen to the ad. We can skip to the, there we go. Skip hey there. there, I am Mike Rignetta, and this is going to be Crash Course World Mythology. We're going to learn about the stories that explain life, the universe, and almost everything. They're so Look entertaining. the beginning of the universe, the end of the universe, who exactly is running said universe. We're going to address a bunch of questions like where children come from, how we got death into Zeus and Odin and their terrible siblings and so kids. They're, they're, they're fast-paced. Um, they might be a little too quick for some kids, but teaching kids how to slow down the videos and to pause and rewind is an important skill with all of this. Uh, anyway, so I have a whole list of YouTube channels that you could use alone or you could use um, an Edpuzzle. Uh, and that was one of the um, resources I wanted to make sure that I shared with you. And I know that we're getting to the end of this, so I'm just going to wrap up with a couple more things here that I want to show you. Some observations that I, I came across um, looking at the resources. We talked earlier about platforms, Schoology, Edmodo. Um, you could use Google Classroom to store all your materials. Uh, you can curate stuff yourself, and I think that's probably the best place to start uh, using some of the resources I provided. Uh, but at some point, you want to make, you might want to make your own videos, and, and some teachers have gotten into that, but it, creating your own videos is pretty time-consuming, so I wouldn't go there until you felt pretty confident with other people's content. That would be my advice to you, because creating videos is, there's an art form to it. Um, some ideas to think about this. You do not necessarily have to use technology for this. Um, I think that's what these people will, this, this group will emphasize. It does involve a lot of preparation and thought. That's my vibe with this, is that you have to kind of plot out what you're doing and be intentional about it. So if you're prepping now for the fall, you know, this might be a good time to kind of map out what do you want this to look like in your classroom, or are there a couple of opportunities within your curriculum that you think this might fit well with? Um, again, make sure that you're scaffolding this for the students and you have to train them, um, and that's not supposed to be no, it's supposed to be on how you want to participate. You can also use other mediums, um, other media, uh, such as podcasts, for instance. Have kids listen to something and then come in. So if you have not explored iTunes, or I guess there's a new, there's a new podcasting app from Google on Android, um, you might want to take a look at that and see if there's content that might be useful to you. And then the other thing I think is really interesting is how can we flip other experiences within the school setting to make things more interesting and lively and to, to save time? And so how are we, um, professional development, um, how can we flip some of that? How can we flip faculty meetings? I know, uh, I know teacher, I know principals will, I've seen some principals give like a short video with kind of the announcements and then he invites questions from the faculty when they actually come to the faculty meeting. Um, there is a link in the resources of flipped playlists for families of stuff that they can do at home with their kids, which I think is a brilliant idea. And there's another link in the resources that I'll show you about flipping parent-teacher conferences, particularly when you're doing student-led conferences where the kids have to kind of take some ownership of the process of communicating their progress to their parents. Um, and then again, as I mentioned before, with elementary students, think about flipping a lesson rather than your entire practice. I think little kids can do this, but you have to keep it really simple. And um, the example that I was looking at today was uh, a teacher had kids 
first grade kids creating some sort of video in an app, and I'm trying to think what the app was, on the, on the letter I and the sounds that it made. And then the kids were gonna produce these things, and then she had a video that gave them the instructions, they made this learning object, and then they were going to show it to kindergarten kids as to teach them, which I thought was interesting. So if you make it developmentally appropriate, I think it can work with elementary. So I put a section in our Google Classroom, and I want you to look through the resources um, this week and find one idea that you might try in what you're doing. Um, and let me t show you some of my the stuff that I, I kept on finding so many good things and I'm like, I gotta stop, but um, you're gonna have more, more to uh, think about than you um, bargained for. So in Google Classroom, which will come up in a second, you're going to go to Tech Talk number nine, and you're going to see um, the video, uh, I'll blow this up a little bit so you can see it, the video that from Common Craft and the Flip Networking Hub, um, I went from kind of basic to some more sophisticated things that you can look at. Uh, I'm trying to think which ones, I, all of them were really good. This one I love, this Global Digital Citizen article, I thought was particularly good. And Global Digital Assistant is a consultant in Australia, and his, his blog is, is generally fabulous. Um, tips on how to ace your own flipped learning classroom activities. And there's some videos in here to writing the script, choosing a method. They're talking about screencasting and that sort of thing here. Um, content curation, which we've talked a little bit. Here's something that you guys were talking about earlier, accountability. What do you do if a child has not viewed the content? Uh, don't re-lecture. Uh, that would send the wrong message that they would decide whether they wanted to participate or not. Um, so teach them how to watch, take notes, engage. Teach them how to work with the foot classroom environment and fewer will resist. Okay. And then you can handle them case by case. Um, and then I think this is another important aspect too is how are we, if we have kids that don't have computers at home or whatever, how, how, are you making, how are you making this an equitable experience? So in all of these, you're gonna find something, there's some more videos, if you'd rather look at videos or lists of apps. Um, here's something about reading assignments, math. I try to find some subject area specific things for you. Um, there's lots, of, here's a physics one. Lots and lots and lots of good stuff. Uh, so just take, just glance through this. There's some primary uh, crowd ones and, um, and see what, what you find exciting. And then if you can take a few minutes between now and next week, I would love it if you put it into Google Classroom, like what's the thing that you want to try based on your own personal explorations. So um, uh, Kim, did you see where they were or do, I, do you want me to repeat where they are? Let me to repeat. Well, I'm, okay. So. I'm, no, well, I'm in the Google Classroom in my personal account. Okay. But I must once again be missing something. Okay. So let me. It, the thing about the Google Classroom font, it's so, it's so teeny here. Let me blow this up. So here's. I'm on this. I'm on the Stream tab, which is the front one. And then on the left hand side, you're going to see the topics, and each week is a different topic. Okay. You see those. Yeah, no, I don't, but I'll look, I'll go back and look at those. I just see the actual file folders for them, and I, yeah. Oh, you know what? You're in Google Drive, I think. Uh, that's where I got the PowerPoint, yes. Yeah, so, but I clicked on the, I'll go, I'll go back in and look at it again. Sorry about that. Yeah. So you know, you know, that's all right. In Google Classroom, just FYI, what they do, when you make an assignment in Google Classroom, it makes a folder in your drive. And, and then also, I, the, Obviously, the, the, the slides are, are in Google Drive, so maybe that's why. It, it, it bounced you out of the classroom. But typically, this is kind of like Facebook. There's a left-hand navigation, and then your stream of stuff in the middle. The left-hand navigation will take you, will, it, it, let, it, it's chunked up the content for you, so you don't have to scroll through everything. Does that make sense? Um, ooh, a cool revised blooms activity for a periodic table. Yay, okay. Um, 
Any other questions? Oh, how to use Digo? You want to go over that again? Okay. Yeah, if, if I can see it, that'd be great. And then I was wondering if you could put up the Bitly link again because I'm trying to log on and it's coming up with an error. Oh, for okay, the slides. Let me just give you the slides. I don't know if I did a Bitly for this week. I should, and I will. Oh no! After this. Get into the resources in the Google Class. Okay. Here's um, here are the slides again. So in case nobody got into that, and then um, and then the resources, yes, please. So the so what bitly I'm sorry I'm blanking on what you're missing here um, in the very beginning of the presentation you should put up a bitly link and I thought that was the link it's the tech talks with Lucy and I thought that was the link that I needed to go to to access Google yeah. class no 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 this is this is actually the flyer that has all of our, our oh schedule. got it okay so how do we get to the Google class again yeah, let me show you that again because that's I think that's half the battle classroom.google.com <laughs> and once you're in you're in and you're going to get lots of notifications from me and you're going to be like really annoyed but you can turn those off. um so there's classroom.google.com and in the upper right hand corner you're going to see a plus sign i'll zoom in there see it looks like that and it's going to say create or join a class and you're going to click that okay. and you're going to put a code, you're going to put a code in yep, go okay yep the code is that's the, that's your classroom code. So um, so like think of classroom.google.com as your home base. For all you know, you may join another Google Classroom down the road for PD or a, a, you know a class you've taken or a class that you're leading, uh, and they'll all will be on that one page, classroom.google.com. Um, yeah, use your personal and Gmail account because you may have funky things there. Um, any other questions or, oh, Digo, um, Valerie, let me show you that and then we'll wrap up. Um, so Digo, I use, everybody has their own method for saving stuff. And I talked about this in our curation um, webinar and I talked about it last week with YouTube. So Digo has been around for a while. Um, there are other bookmarking tools out there. So it's kind of an old, it's kind of an old technology. Um, before this, I used something that, that Yahoo had called Delicious, which I don't know if it exists anymore. Um, but Digo has been around for a while. I have a pro account, so I have a little bit more features than a free account, but there is a free account. And I just find that if I, I, I want one place where I can find stuff that's web-based. I don't want it to be saved to my computer because if I log into another computer or device, I won't be able to find it. So um, if I were you also, if you're interested in using Digo, there is, there is um, Digo for educators. There might be educator pricing or free version. There's a, there's a free upgrade for educators. So if you go to digo.com slash education, um, you can apply to get an educator account. So with every tool that you try, especially if they're not free, you know, find out if they have educator licensing because um, you don't want to have to pay for something that, you know, that they might give to you for free. Uh, startups tend to like teachers because they really use these tools well and they can get a lot of data and information and feedback from educators trying out their stuff. Uh, and they also want to be nice to teachers, of course. Um, so they'll often will have some sort of, you know, uh, free version or whatever. So look around for that. Anyway, um, I don't want to get too complicated with this, but I have a Chrome extension um, that I've installed in my Chrome browser for Digo. And you find it under tools when you're logged into your Digo account. You can just install it. They also have uh, other tools for, this will work on all browsers. Um, there's a mobile app, um, but there's lots of cool tools here. So you would either use the Chrome extension or install this on Firefox or, or Safari or uh, Internet Explorer. And so when I go to a website um, and I find an article that I like that I want to save, um, um, let's see. Um, 
this was this was kind of a, I saw this article and I thought it was actually kind of cool. I think I've already bookmarked it. Anyway, so um, I can save it for future reference, and I do that so I can find stuff on the fly when I'm prepping for things. So I click on my Digo bookmarklet. Um, and this pops up and I save it and I keep, I, um, um, I was finding resources related to the current crisis and, and I, I tagged them with that. So it remembered the tag, but I can type in, you know, something like this and I can make it public or private and save it. When I go to my Digo library automatic, you know, immediately, that link is going to be at the top of my stuff. And I can always find it again. I can find things by tag. So I could find everything that I have tagged previously and saved with um, Flip Classroom tag, for instance. So this is how I save my stuff. So when I'm prepping for your webinars or whatever, I look through what I already have to see if I need anything new. And um, they also have outliners, so you can make a list and share it with people. And then they also have groups where you can collaborate um, with people. You can bookmark together. And um, in the groups last week, I talked about how uh, I have a group where people can share uh, together. All these, all these people you see on the right are bookmarking in this group on stuff related to YouTube. So I find it stop shopping and and at digital workflow so you don't have to go looking for things it saves an enormous amount of time okay uh yeah and that bookmarks bar is just useless after a while and if you have five million things so i hope that helps um any other questions about this i mean this is a really cursory introduction to flip learning it's a pretty hefty topic but you know start small and 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 try it out and see how it works. And 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 I think that's a trick to being a good teacher too is experiment in a controlled way in your classroom, then learn to tweak it and make it better or ditch it and and, and try something else. But uh, I think you'll I think you'll as a professional will be more interested in your work if you take that approach and your students will you know I think students when they have a teacher that engages them, they'll eat things up. I really do. Um, so anyway, um, I'm going to stop sharing and thanks for coming everyone. And we didn't have any interlopers tonight. So that's always a good thing. Right. And, uh, let me turn on my video. I should have turned on my video before. Here I am. Hi everybody. Um, what, what computer am I on here? Um, so, uh, thanks for coming. And if you have any more questions, please stick around. Kim, I can chat with you if you want to chat or we can chat another day. That's fine with me. Um, but thanks for coming everyone. Thank you so much. See you next week. Okay, bye guys.